tonight, uh, at 6 o'clock, be here early for the Christmas outreach program. Matthew 2, verse number 11. I'm like Brother David, I missed my big pulpit, but I would have narrowed it down to a tenth of what we have, and so I just don't have enough room up here. Amen. Yeah, sure, yeah. Verse number 11. The Bible says, And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary and his mother, Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Amen. Praise God. I want to speak this morning for just a short time on this thought. God's unspeakable gift. It's Christmas. God's unspeakable gift. It is Christmas. Probably most of you have heard of the lady who uh, was Christmas shopping and she was running from store to store trying to get everything that she wanted for Christmas and she was feeling frazzled and she had her two small children with her. Let me just tell you, shopping is no fun with small children. Uh, if you'd like to try, I, I could volunteer. <laughs> So as she's darting through the mall and she's catching the elevator to go to the second store of the mall to try to find out where those Christmas gifts are that she wants to get for that special person, she's crammed into the elevator and everybody's getting inside. And uh, as the elevator is crowded to the max, in the back she says, I wish I knew who come up with this idea of Christmas. I'll hang them up and string up. And from the front of the elevators, someone said, they already did. Amen. They already did. And so, our focus at Christmas isn't just about a cradle, but it's about cross and what God has done for us. The Bible says that when they were coming to the house, they saw Mary's mother, they presented unto him gifts Gold and frankincense and myrrh. We're entering the beginning of the New Testament as we see the birth of Christ. And Matthew is giving his gospel. Two-thirds of the Bible is the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, we see that, that, that the Bible is dealing mostly with God's people Israel. And when God is looking at His people Israel, He's wanting a relationship with them. And uh, it seems like as He calls this earthly nation Israel into a relationship with Him, they continually are rejecting uh, Him. And so the New Testament brings the transition that God is wanting to give and have relationship with these, this nation Israel, the Jews. But transition happens and God gives His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and He reaches beyond the Jews and He reaches to the Gentiles. And, and the Bible says in John chapter number 1, verse number 11 and verse number 13, He came to His own and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born, not of blood, not of the, the will of flesh, and not of the will of man, but of God. God comes and He's wanting to have a relationship with whosoever will. Aren't you glad for that hope? If there's one word this Christmas that rings out to me, it is hope. It is hope. God gives me hope. And God gives you hope. And God gives anybody in any situation hope. Isn't that a powerful word? We talk about it often. The Bible, and I say this scripture over and over, but it means so much to me. That The Bible says, Solomon said, that hope defer makes one sick. But when hope is given, it is a tree of life. If there's anything about Christmas, it is hope. If Mary ever wrapped up anything, she wrapped up the gift of hope. Some of you, it's particularly children, uh, they're probably hoping for a lot of things. You know, they'll, they'll give you the wish list of what they're hoping for. And oh, they want it. 
I know when we were little, we, we didn't have the internet. And so uh, we had this great big thick catalog called the Sears and Roebuck uh, uh, catalog. And it was a wish book. And you looked through it. And did anyone ever look through that book? Yeah, okay, good, good. Uh, uh, and you would look through it and you would see things and you would hope for it, that you would hope on Christmas that it would show up. The whole reason why we give gifts is because God gave His greatest gift. And in our traditions in Eastern culture, we give gifts because God showed that He gives the very best gift. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Throughout the Old Testament, God is trying to teach man something that you have sinned. When man fell in the Garden of Eden, and Adam and Eve partake, partook of that fruit which was forbidden, and all of a sudden, in the middle of beauty, thorns started growing up, and they're, they're, they're experiencing pain, and they're experiencing that they have to work, and they're experiencing that they're no longer clothed by the glory of God. They're experiencing sin, and so all along, they're trying to work to get into right relationship with God. We know that the Bible tells us uh, that, that, that God wanted man to give gifts to him so that he, he could forgive them of their sins. And we look in the Old Testament, kings always were given gifts. Look at it. Look, 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 tradition, what happens when you came to a king, no matter how poor you were, you were to give something in honor to the king. And so we look at God being king of kings and lord of lords, and we're wanting to be forgiven of our sins, and we can only bring gifts in hope to be forgiven of sin. You look at Leviticus chapter number 5, and I'm going to read, I'm going to break it up into different verses, but the Bible says in Leviticus chapter number 5, I'm going to hit parts of verse 1, 6, 7, 13, 11, and 13, but listen to this as I read it to you. And if a soul sin, he shall bring a lamb for a sin offering. And if he be not able to bring a lamb, he shall bring two turtle doves. But if he be not able to bring two turtle doves, then he that sin shall bring fine flour for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven of him. So in the Old Testament, we're taught two things. You look at kings, and everyone was to bring gifts to king. Kings, King David, they were to bring gifts to all the kings throughout the Old Testament. So gifts had to be given to a king. And the next thing that we realize is that we have to give even to God to be able to get our sins forgiven. If you're wealthy, then, then, then you bring a lamb. If you're not as wealthy, then you bring two turtle doves. And if you're really not wealthy, you just bring some finely ground up flour and you give it to the priest and they will offer it to God as an atonement to your sins. But I love the transition that happens from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Remember, two thirds of our Bible is Old Testament. And so we're all with this knowledge of giving to a king and giving to have remission of sins. But then we come into the New Testament and we find that, well, things change. As crucial as it was to give to a king, you know, uh, money or gifts or some type of sacrifice, and you would have a penalty if you didn't give to the king. We come to the New Testament and things change. I want you to think about how blessed we are to live where we are and to experience Christmas. Because now, not that we give to a king, but a king gives to us. And now, not do we, Brother David, have to purchase, Brother Josh, our redemption from God by bringing something. But He gave that we may know forgiveness of sin. How powerful is that? That a king would love us so much that he would give. That a God would love us so much that he would make a way. See, God didn't give back anything in the Old Testament. He loaded, uh, uh, some people may, may, may think that, but he loaded them daily with benefits. But God was trying to teach them something that as much as you give and the very best that you give, you can never, ever, ever give enough to be worthy of the gift of salvation. And so we find in Ephesians chapter number 4, the Bible says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. 
Christmas is this, that it is the gift of Jesus Christ that was given to us. Amen. There is going to be lots of gift giving over this season. There's going to be lots of parties. And there's going to be lots of family traditions. There's going to be a lot of great things. I love the laughter that's in the air. I love the spirit of Christmas. I love the spirit of giving. I love the spirit of coming together. But I love the greatest gift that was ever given. And that is Jesus Christ. And that is what Christmas is about. The Bible says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And now he has ascended, uh, but he, that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth, that he ascended in the same also that ascended up far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. Do you know what? I want to tell you something. That when we know someone who has died in the faith, they put their confidence and their trust in God. Amen. The hope of Christmas is this. Amen. Because Christ not only is ascended, but first of all, He descended to take the powers of death and of hell and of the grave so that He could ascend to show that when someone dies in the faith, hope is still given. Amen. So I know we deal with that at Christmas. The loss of family and friends. We think about that. But in the middle of all that, can I say that He descended and ascended so that hope could be risen in us. The gift of Christ. The gift of hope. He walked on the water. He ascended that He may show us that He's God, that He can do anything that seems impossible. I don't know about you, but I've not recently tried walking on water. It usually doesn't work to me. You know, I, 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 I guess I still like to jump in mud puddles sometimes. Probably not as much as I did years ago, right? Maybe some of you like to splice around or whatever. But, but I've never been able to master the craft of walking on water in other way. But he did. He ascended or descended to show us that he was God. Could we be playing this morning? He's God. This Christmas, He's God. The gift is to show us that God came down among us to work, to do the very impossible. And there may be folks in the sanctuary that you're sitting and you think that there are things that simply seem impossible, but I want you to know that it's possible with God. With men, these things may be impossible, but with God, all things are impossible possible. He descended to show us that He was God's gift of hope. That even in impossibility, amen, that He is still the one who works a far greater work than what we're able to do. And He's ascended that He's praying for us. Hebrews 7.25 says, Wherefore He is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing that He ever liveth to make intercession for them. So do you know where the Christ of Christmas is? this very moment he's sitting on the right hand of God the Father and when we pray he is the mediator that's making intercession with God he's saying there is that that Tina Lehman down there in Millersburg and she needs this and, and so he's petitioning for us there is that Bobby Dietrich in Wiccanisco I heard his prayer and, and father this is what he needs Amen. There is a Tiffany Lucas, and whether she's in Likens working or down in Harrisburg working, God hears the prayer. And, and it's ascending to the Father through Jesus. So when things seem unhopeful, what did I say that was wrong? Tiffany Lucas. See, he doesn't get that mixed up. He knows that you've been married 15 years. I'm sorry. She was just a little girl when I came here, right? So, yeah. Wow. My apologies. And by the way, you married a great fellow. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Pardon my, uh, my, uh, my little blip there. But he still knows. God knows. He doesn't get that mixed up. So whatever our impossibility, He has sent it at Christmas to let us know that there is hope. There's hope. Why can I be hopeful? Why can I experience joy? 
Because the gift of Christmas is the greatest of all gifts. And the message is this, is that He is here and anything can happen. You see, He's the gift. When He was talking to the woman at the well, her life was so mixed up. Think about this. With what little knowledge I have, and I don't think you have to have much to see how messed up this lady's life is. She goes from relationship to relationship. Maybe she's looking for something in a relationship. Maybe she's a bad chooser of fellows. I don't know what it is. But all together there, her life is pretty mixed up because she's looking for love and acceptance. And one day, she's so embarrassed because of the life that she lives. She comes to the well when it's the hottest part of the day. Jesus knew that she would be there. So he sent his disciples, go on to town, but I'm staying here. There's some need that I need to meet. And so this woman who is embarrassed about her life, she comes to the well in the middle of the day. And she begins to talk. And this is what Jesus said. If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, give me drink, thou wouldest ask of him, and he would have given Given, given, given the living water. Can I tell you the best gift of all is Jesus. When life is mixed up and when we're mixed up and when our situations is less than what they should be, when we're embarrassed, when it's overwhelming to us, He is the gift that continues to give. He's the gift that gives and the death and divorce and diagnosis. He's the one that still gives and all of that. God's gift. And so, Christmas, it's forgiven. But God gave the greatest. But He gave the gift of salvation to us. I wonder how often at Christmas we look at the gift and pass by. We look at the gift and we never allow it to be received and given to us. It is the greatest gift. John said it this way, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, for whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. I think I've said this somewhat already, but... I love the innocence of children every year at Christmas. I think it's the highlight. Because they don't have all that baggage that we carry in our life. We have the memories, we have the bad stuff that's happened to us. If I was to ask you here, and, and please pardon my terminology, I'm just trying to Maybe some of you will be gathered around the table and you think, oh, I do not want to have to sit with that crazy again. <laughs> or their situation, or their story. Or they hurt me. I don't want to have to. Families can be like that. And some folks can really dread these Christmases because of things that happened many, many years ago. But I, I want to tell you that not only does God give the greatest gift, but it gives us the liberty and the choice also to give the greatest gifts. I wonder if there's things that we need to be letting go of here at Christmas. Things that has affected our life that maybe we just need to forgive. That we just need to forget. How many has ever thought about Joseph and his life? And Joseph and his life, his brothers hate him because... Brother Al, his dad makes him this coat that's so different. It's a coat of many colors. It's and It's amazing. And so no one else gets that. And so Joseph has these crazy dreams that everybody's going to be bowing down before him. And he's crazy enough to share them. But they're really from God. Joseph knows they're from God and he holds on to it. But not everybody understands what God's working and doing in our life. Can I say that again? Not everybody understands what God is working and doing in our life. So it's okay if they don't understand. 
But here it is that they take that coat, they tear it up, and they sell him into slavery. He's treated in such a way that he should not be treated. Potiphar's house, she mistreats him, and we find out he goes in prison, he's mistreated. And finally, he interprets a dream he's forgotten about until one day when the king has a dream and they remember him. And now he rises to the place where he's a pharaoh. And this is the tough day that comes. They've changed. He's changed. They look different. He looks different. They come for food. He recognizes them. They don't recognize him. I feel like there's almost Christmas in Egypt this day. Because he sends everybody out. Genesis 45, the Bible says, Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all that stood by him. And he cried, and he caused every man to go out for, uh, caused every man to go out for me. And there stood no man with him. And Joseph made himself known unto his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. Sometimes we just need to let go of things at Christmas. Because that's the best gift. Because God has given us forgiveness and God has given us salvation. And when we begin to look and compare how God has treated us, could we do any less for anybody else? And so the gift of Christmas is saying this, that I'm embracing all and I'm loving and I'm forgiving. How awesome is that? And you may say, Brother Seville, Pastor, I wish that I, there was some scripture or there's some special remedy that you could give me a formula that would help me to forgive. I will. It's called choose. It's a choice. Just as God chose to love the world and send His only begotten Son. And we accept His gift. We can't help but to continue to give the gift of forgiveness. How powerful was that? The gift of Christmas. I'm going to ask my wife if she would come to the piano this morning. You know what I would love for us all to do in here? I would love for us all this Christmas to experience Christmas in the innocency and the purity as children. Do you think that's possible? I do. I do. I believe that this can be the most hopeful Christmas that we have as we accept God's unspeakable gift. I want to ask you this morning, do you know Jesus as your Savior? The Bible says that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That sin in the Old Testament revealed to us that as good as we give and as much as we give, it's still not good enough. So God said, you don't have to give to me anymore. I'm giving to you, my son, Jesus. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This morning, Christmas is about the purity of a child. Confessing our sins and accepting Him as our Savior, knowing that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you've not done that this morning, I want to encourage you to, by faith, reach out to God and ask Him to forgive you of your sins and accept the current gift of Jesus Christ this Christmas. And if this morning there's things, there's baggage that's holding you back, before we make it to Christmas and before we enter a new year, we'll just have to get rid of this stuff. If there's old feelings that you're hanging on to, the gift of Jesus Christ gives us the liberty to make a choice. that relationship in the past that has hurt you? And we 
would you choose to give grace for there's only resentment and pain right now? And then for others, I'm going to ask you to do this. Would you lift your eyes to an ascended God? He was descended down to earth to show us that He forgives of sin, that He makes the impossible possible. And would you allow the faith of a child to rise in your heart? And would you say, God, I'm going to allow hope to be birthed in this. And I'm going to trust you with the situation. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Mr. Holly, I'm going to give you liberty to sing for a few moments. Wherever you're at, as Sister Holly sings, would you just say, God, thank you for giving. I accept the gift. And I give the gift of me back to you. Merry Christmas, Jesus. Amen. Take a few moments in the presence of God before this is this morning. Just to allow the gift of Jesus Christ to be given wholly to you. And would you receive that gift? There is hope.